We are in the middle of the sixth extinction. Species are going extinct at a thousand times the baseline rate, and we are losing 200 species every single day. Not since the dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago has there been a mass extinction event. Three quarters of life on Earth disappeared then, and in a massive stroke of luck for humans, this extinction event allowed mammals to flourish. The dinosaurs roamed the Earth for at least 230 million years. Humans, on the other hand, have only been around for a few hundred thousand years. In that time, and more importantly, since the Industrial Revolution, humans have impacted the planet massively. We have filled the oceans with plastic, killed off most of the large megafauna, cut down vast forests, and polluted the rivers, air, and oceans. Through the burning of fossil fuels for energy, we have increased the amount of carbon in our atmosphere from around 275 parts per million in 1750 to more than 415 parts per million in 2019. Concentrations of methane and nitrous oxide have followed similar trends. Greenhouse gases that accumulate in the atmosphere trap excess energy and cause the atmosphere to warm. This is known as the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is what has kept Earth's temperature stable for billions of years. But when we burn ancient biomass for fuel, we load the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, and these are the cause of our warming world. The world is 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer today than in 1850. This may not sound a lot, but that is the global average. Some places have risen by more than twice that amount. In the past 20 years, greenhouse gases have risen by 30 parts per million. To put that in perspective, in the past 2,000 years, the rate of increase has never been above 30 parts per million every 1,000 years. Human activities are radically altering the Earth's atmosphere. The oceans have absorbed 90% of this excess heat, and the energy absorbed by them equals an astonishing Hiroshima-sized bomb every second for 150 years. Try to imagine the scale of what we have done. One Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb every single second of every single minute of every single hour of every single day for 150 years. And it gets worse, as the warming has increased to between three and six Hiroshima-sized bombs per second. Let that sink in for a while. By loading our oceans and atmosphere with all this extra heat, we are beginning to see the results. 2018 saw temperature records shattered across the globe, and then they were shattered again in 2019. All over the planet, on every continent, temperature records are falling. These are some of the records that were broken in summer 2019. The temperature in the Arctic is of most concern. 34.8 degrees at the top of our world is extremely worrying for many reasons, but mainly because of the positive food feedback loop it enforces. Positive feedback loops are when an action reinforces a further action, which in turn reinforces a further action, and so forth. This continues without human intervention. Positive feedback loop 1 happens when the warming temperature melts Arctic sea ice. The sea ice acts as a giant mirror at the top of our planet and reflects heat back into space. When this ice melts, the darker ocean absorbs this heat and the planet gets warmer, which melts more sea ice and the cycle continues. This warming is already impacting our planet at just 1.1 degrees of warming. Japan hit the record 41.1 degrees Celsius in 2018, and this resulted in 1,032 deaths. Storms are becoming fre stronger and more frequent. Mozambique was hit by two storms in 2019. More than 1,000 people were killed and 400,000 were left homeless. Cyclone Idai is considered the strongest storm to ever hit the southern, southern hemisphere. Hurricane Dorian rammed into the Bahamas just a year after Puerto Rico suffered massive damage. In 2018, Typhoon Jebi barreled into Japan and caused $12.6 billion worth of damage. More than 10 people died. This was the strongest storm to hit Japan in 25 years. We had to update this presentation after Typhoon Hagibis struck Japan in October 
This was followed by flooding in Chiba, which claimed the lives of 10 more people. With warmer temperatures comes the increased threat of wildfires. The fire season is becoming longer as the ground dries out quicker every year. These fires produce more carbon, and this acts as another positive feedback loop as they warm the planet and cause even more fires. Whilst wildfires are common in many places, they are becoming more frequent and burning wider areas as the ground is drier. The Amazon saw record burning in 2019, and whilst this wasn't caused by climate change, it will have a great impact on the climate. The fires here were to turn rainforest into grazing lands for animal agriculture. In Africa, fires raged through forests. Australia is seeing earlier than expected spring fires, and 2.5 million people were without power in California in late October as thousands of buildings were lost to the flames. These fires are even occurring in Alaska and Siberia. These fires lead to another positive feedback loop as pollution from the fires settles on Arctic ice. This ice becomes darker and absorbs more heat, which leads to melting. Less heat is reflected and the planet becomes warmer, which leads to more wildfires and the cycle continues without human intervention. Another result of our warmer climate is droughts. Warmer air causes more water to evaporate and this is one of the biggest concerns to humanity. Australia saw just 11% less rainfall than the average in 2018, and September saw the second lowest months for rainfall since records began. In total, Australia saw its third warmest year on record after 2013 and 2005. The United States also recorded droughts across 39.6% of the contigu contiguous United States in February 2018. Billions of dollars worth of crops were destroyed. In rich countries like the USA, temporary droughts can be managed. But south of the border, countries aren't as able to cope. In El Salvador, a 2018 drought destroyed 13.35% of the first sown corn. 20,303 hectares were affected in all. Guatemala has also experienced uh, loss of corn due to drought conditions and in Honduras some areas are, are only have water available four days a week. Nicaragua also reported lost crops and livestock in 2018 and Costa Rican farmers are warning the country will have to import rice due to the decrease in planting area. Almost 300,000 Costa Ricans suffer from water shortages. The situation is even direr in Africa. Almost 7 million people are severely food insecure in South Sudan, with 21,000 living in famine conditions. This is the most in the country's history. 860,000 people in South Sudan are expected to suffer from acute malnutrition in 2019. Somalia faces an uncertain future too, with 1.7 million people facing acute food insecurity. This is double the number in 2017 and is expected to increase. Around 1 million children in Somalia are expected to suffer from acute malnutrition this year. The areas in red are severe drought and brown drought conditions. South Asia is facing massive water shortages as water runs dry through at least 21 cities, including New Delhi, Bengaluru, Chennai and Hyderabad. 100 million people in these cities will run out of water by 2020. All around the world, from Morocco to Iraq and Spain to Chile, water resources are going dry. Paradoxically, many areas are often the same and often the same areas are hit by extreme flooding. Millions weren't affected in Nepal and India in July. Millions were affected in Nepal and India in July with tens of thousands of people displaced. Australia was also hit by massive rains and crocodiles and snakes were seen being swept along with floodwaters. From January to May 2019, 
the US suffered its worst, wettest period on record. This affected corn production with only half the usual crops planted by the usual time. Indiana was only one-fifth of normal levels and only 22% of soybeans were planted before the floods compared to 63% in 2018. Japan is especially prone to heavy flooding and the resulting mudslides, which have proven deadly in recent years. More than 200 people lost their lives in western Japan in 2018. These were the worst floods for almost 40 years. The droughts and natural disasters we are witnessing around the globe are driving migration. Since 2008, 161 countries have experienced environmental disasters which have led to the displacement of people. Between 2008-2013, an average of 350,000 people sought entry to the EU each year because of environmental disasters. This seems like a lot of people until you consider that this number could rise to 200 million when the full impacts of climate change are felt. The UN's IPCC 2018 report highlighted that 350 million people would be exposed to drought at 1.5 degrees of warming and a further 60 million if the temperature is allowed to rise to 2 degrees. Extreme weather and sea level rise will add to the numbers of people on the march in the coming decades and people in rich countries will have to tackle the ethics of what we do to help. Due to our high emissions and comfortable lives, we have created this problem for people in the global south. Will we accept them into our homes, or will we leave them to die? Will we build bridges, or will we build walls? Our future. So far we have looked at the situation around the world today. We have seen the extreme weather events, the droughts, the wildfires, the floods, and the weather-caused migrations. What of our combined future? In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that we must cut emissions by 45% to have any chance of staying within 1.5 degrees. The carbon budget we have does not allow us to burn much more fossil fuels or we will no longer be able to prevent runaway climate change. On our present tra trajectory, almost 38 gigatons and growing, we have only until 2013 30 before we exceed the 420 gigaton CO2 limit to stay within 1.5 degrees, and that only gives us a 66% chance of doing so. If we don't meet this target and continue with, on with our current path, then the probability of successfully staying within 1.5 degrees drops with every gigaton of carbon emitted. If we emit 580 gigatons of CO2, then our chances drop to only 50-50. The question we should ask here is would we put our children on a plane with only a 66% chance of landing? 50%? Less? We all know the answer to this question, but that is exactly what we are doing by continuing busyless as usual. These are some of the impacts we will see in a 2 degree warmer world compared to those at 1.5 degrees. Twice as many people will be exposed to water scarcity, 1.7 times more people will be impacted by floods, 60 million more people will face drought conditions, 10 centimetres of extra sea level rise will impact 145 million people, the Arctic sea ice will be 10 times less in summer, 99% of coral will disappear, 50% more habitat will be lost, twice as many invertebrates will become extinct, and 37% of the world's population will be exposed to extreme heat days. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we okay with this? If the answer is no, then we must act immediately to prevent it from happening. Unfortunately, it seems our leaders are more than okay with this happening. In response to the IPCC calls for 45% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, Prime Minister Abe has offered to cut emissions by 26%. That's just over half what the IPCC is says is necessary to avoid the conditions highlighted in the previous slide. What kind of person decides it's okay to allow these things to happen? As typhoons and floods kill dozens in Japan, the leader of our country is intent on making matters worse, which will, without doubt, result in many more deaths in Japan in the coming years and around the world. 
that isn't the worst of it. According to the Japan Times, Japan is only on course to deliver 7% cuts by the 2030 deadline. This behaviour cannot and should not be acceptable to us. It will result in the deaths and forced migration of potentially hundreds of millions of people and the extinction of many species. This is not what leaders are elected to do. They are supposed to provide safety to their citizens. A failure to provide this safety results in the social contract being broken. We give up some freedoms in exchange for security. The government is ensuring our safety will be threatened by its wholly inadequate response to this crisis. As people lose their lives, Prime Minister Abbott sends his thoughts and prayers. We do not need thoughts and prayers. We need the government to act immediately to stop dangerous levels of warming and the ensuing chaos it will bring. Let's look at the chaos this lack of action will unleash on our planet. With our current policies, we are heading for a 3 degrees to 3.4 degrees warmer world by 2100. Just imagine what this will look like. The storms, the floods, wildfires and, and that we are witnessing at just 1.1 degrees of warming multiplied. A report by Earth League researchers state that we have a 10% chance of exceeding 6 degrees. Is this the world we want our children and grandchildren to inhabit? Japan may be 4.6 degrees hotter by 2100. The Arctic is an area of great importance in our struggle against cataclysmic climate change. Its ice does not affect sea level change as it is floating ice, but it does affect global temperatures through the feedback loop of melting ice opening up the darker sea to absorb more heat and kick off a warming cycle. The Arctic has been warming since the 1960s, but from the 19 onward, 1990s onwards, that warming has speeded up. The temperature in the Arctic has been erratic in 2019. The temperatures are off the scale compared to the norm. And you can see how the temperature rise is directly affecting the reduction in sea ice. This is not the scariest feedback loop that has scientists alarmed. A much scarier aspect of our current situation is what scientists call the carbon bomb. This refers to the permafrost in the Arctic Circle. This is land that has been frozen for millennia. Under the permafrost is stored tons and tons of methane, 40 times as much as was emitted in 2018 to be more precise, and roughly twice as much as humans have emitted in our history. While we know fairly accurately how much humans are emitting and what temperature increase that will cause, the carbon bomb is difficult to predict. It is thawing though, and much faster than scientists predicted. This positive feedback loop could end any hopes we have of keeping temperatures stable. As methane is emitted, this raises temperatures, and the increased temperature in turn thaws more permafrost, which releases more methane, and the cycle continues without human interference. This will result in what is known as runaway climate change. We need to be very aware of this potential warming, and it is not included in any IPCC reports. The worrying news is that this permafrost is thawing 70 years earlier than scientists expected. When it comes to sea level rise, there are two areas we need to worry about, Greenland and Antarctica. This photo was taken in June 2019 and shows melt water on top of ice. Again, this water absorbs more heat and in turn melts more ice and the cycle continues. Greenland was affected by Europe's record-breaking heat wave and it recorded its own record on July 29th and 30th. From the graph, you can see how much ice loss in Greenland has increased on the 1981-2010 average. The amount of ice loss to melting has increased rapidly since 2010 and shows no sign of slowing down due to the record heat waves we are seeing. If this continues and all the ice is lost, we will experience 7 metres of sea level rise globally. The largest area of ice on our planet is in the Antarctic. Scientists thought the ice here was stable for a long time until scientists discovered that melting in the last five years is now happening three times as fast as it was. 
This current melt could add 25 centimetres to sea level rise by 2070 and could lead to the entire West Antarctic ice sheet disappearing. This would lead to 5 metres of sea level rise. This would flood most coastal cities. The feedback loop would then kick in and the warmer waters and atmosphere would in turn melt East Antarctica, resulting in sea level rise of 60 metres. Erosion and sea level rise is already displacing hundreds of thousands of people a year, though our media gives it little attention. These numbers will seem like small change by 2100 when a staggering 20% of our 10 billion population is expected to be displaced by sea level rise. Already Europe and the USA are seeing tensions rise with just a few million people on the move. How will the world of our grandchildren cope with two billion humans looking for a new place to live. Temperatures are on course to rise well over three degrees by the end of the century. This is without factoring in the carbon bomb in the Arctic. That could possibly double that figure. At just three degrees of warming, scientists predict we will see major cities like New York, Miami, Shanghai, and even London go underwater. You can see from this map all the vulnerable areas Asia will be worst hit, with Tokyo facing annual flooding by 2050. Kumamoto faces being submerged every year. Hiroshima will be completely inundated, and Nagoya's citizens face a very difficult future. Osaka, Hong Kong and Shanghai are among those with the highest populations to be affected. Not only Osaka will be hit hard, most Japanese live on the crowded 30,000 km coastline, and this coastline is about to be redrawn. You can see here Osaka today, and next Osaka at 3 degrees of warming. Other cities like Nagoya, Tokyo, Sendai, Kumamoto, Nagasaki, Fukuoka and Hiroshima will also be inundated by rising seas. At just one metre of sea level rise, Japan will lose 90.3% of its, be its beaches. Sea levels are expected to rise by at least 2 metres by 2100, and 46% of Japanese will be affected. You can see from the map that Japan will be severely hit at just 2 degrees of warming. We will likely hit 2 degrees of warming by mid-century, and while the seas will take longer to rise, rise they will. Once we lock them in, they will not be stopped. 47% of industrial output is at risk and over $1 trillion in assets will be vulnerable. Japan is part of a group of countries that can expect to see le sea level rise of between 10 and 20% higher than the glo global average. You can see from the map how Tokyo will be impacted at two degrees and four degrees of warming. It's worth looking at these temperatures we keep seeing, one degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, we know they will melt the ice, raise sea levels and displace millions. But what are the dangers of living in this warmer world? The point at which humidity and heat can kill is called the wet bulb temperature. At 100% humidity, a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius proves fatal within days or hours to people in good health, in ideal theoretical conditions. As James Hansen puts it in a passage quoted by Curry, even a person lying quietly naked in hurricane force winds would be unable to survive such temperatures. If we can't shed our waste heat, our organs fail and death results. We all know how hot and humid it gets in Japan during the summer months. It's not uncommon to see days with 90 plus humidity and close to 40 degree temperatures. In 2018, 1,032 people perished in the heat wave that swept the country. What will happen if the temperature rises and humidity does too? It will take a temperature of 52.7 degrees Celsius matched with 95% humidity to reach the point where healthy people drop dead from heat. Of course, the elderly and young are more at risk and the temperature and humidity will be deadly at lower relative humidity for these groups. These temperatures will make it extremely difficult to work outdoors. Another effect of a warming planet is that more moisture is evaporated. 
This is already resulting in droughts all across our planet, from Australia to Sudan and Somalia to California. Today, around 40% of the global population is affected by water scarcity, and by 2030, 700 million people will be forced to leave their homes because of drought. Within five years, much of India will face water scarcity. Pakistan faces a similar situation. A lack of food and water will likely exacerbate tensions between these two nuclear-armed neighbours. The problem of water scarcity is not limited to South Asia. Iraq, which is already suffering after two US-led wars, a decade of US-led sanctions and terrorist violence, will see water stress double in many areas. Likewise, Iran, Syria, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia will see water stress increase significantly. There is an enormous tension in these countries already, but with added drought and a lack of food, tensions are likely to rise dramatically. North Africa will also be badly affected by drought, with Morocco hit hardest, but Algeria and Libya are also expected to see water stress increase by 1.4 times. These countries are stopping points on many refugees' journeys from sub-Saharan Africa to Europe, but water shortages and food insecurity may also lead to people from these countries heading across the Mediterranean in search of safety. The closest route is across the Strait of Gibraltar to Spain. Unfortunately, Spain will also be suffering from a lack of water, with most of the country expected to be 1.4 times more water stressed by 2040. Much of Latin America, including large sections of Mexico and Brazil and regions bordering the Mediterranean Sea, could also become especially dry. Large parts of Southwest Asia, most of Africa and Australia will see particularly dry conditions. Southeast Asia, including parts of China and neighbouring countries, will also be badly affected. Japan might not suffer from these droughts like conditions, although Tokyo is one of 11 cities projected to run out of water in the coming decades, largely due to Tokyo's rainfall coming in just four months of the year. The largest problem for Japan is food security, food insecurity. Like many developed countries, Japan's self-sufficiency has been decreasing sharply over the last 50 years. In 2018, due to the climate-caused storms that ravaged the country, Japan relied on other countries for 63% of its calorific intake. When other countries are affected by drought and can no longer guarantee food for their populations, they will be unable to export food. This could lead to a huge shortfall in the amount of food Japan is able to import. As we have seen, these water shortages will begin in the next decade. One area where Japan will be hit hard is heavier rainfall. This will increase in strength and frequency in the coming years. Japan is projected to see an increase in mean precipitation by more than 10% this century, with summer rainfall expected to rise by 17 to 19%. Hokkaido will see an increase in heavy rain events, and typhoons will also increase in severity and frequency. More rainfall will lead to more mudslides like those which have killed dozens in the last past five years. This increase in rainfall and typhoon strength is due to warming oceans. Warming oceans lead to more evaporation and more moisture in the atmosphere, which leads to more rainfall. Since 1990, typhoons which have hit East and Southeast Asia have intensified by 12 to 15 percent. The number of the larger Category 4 and 5 storms has also doubled in that period and in some places tripled. Their destructive power has also increased by 50 percent. Metropolises across Asia can expect to see super-strength typhoons barrel through, raising infrastructure losses from $3 tr trillion in 2005 to $35 trillion in 2070. As you can see, Japan is at the forefront of the climate crisis. Many Japanese think this is a global problem and not a problem they need to worry about. A 2009 study found that 23.8% of Japanese respondents thought the environment was world's biggest problem, but only 2.5% of those considered it to be Japan's biggest issue. That is not the case. Japan scored second globally on the overall natural hazard list and third on the single natural hazard list. 
the climate crisis is part of a wider ecological problem, including the sixth mass extinction. Human actions since 1970 have led to the deaths of 60% of animal populations. This is largely due to loss of habitat and the use of pesticides and other chemicals. By the middle of this century, scientists predict half of all known species could go extinct. Depending on the number of species on our planet, species loss is believed to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times the natural extinction rate. If there are 2 million different species on Earth, then we are witnessing between 200 and 2,000 extinctions per year. If there are, as many predict, 100 million different species, then we are losing between 10,000 and 100,000 species a year. The high end of that figure means we are losing 273 species a day. We are all aware of the plight of tigers, polar bears, pandas and whales. But these are the most visible losses. The world will be a terribly sad place without them. We have lived side by side since the dawn of our species. We have grown up with them. Their names are among the first things we say as children. We learn to draw them before drawing humans. They are part of us. However, from a pragmatic perspective, it is the smaller and less attractive creatures that humans will miss most. Out of the 100 crop species that provide us with 90% of our food, 35% are pollinated by bees, birds and bats. Due to human activity, including our excessive use of pesticides and insecticides, bee, bird and bat populations are declining rapidly. Honeybees alone pollinate around $170 billion worth of crops worldwide. From April 1st, 2018 to April 1st, 2019, the managed bee population fell by 40.7%. Some areas have seen 90% declines. Insects are also going quietly extinct. 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. This extinction is eight times faster than that of mammals birds and reptiles. Insect populations are declining at an astonishing 2.5% a year. They could vanish from the face of Earth this century at these rates. The soil under our feet is dying too. 30 soccer fields of soil are lost every minute, largely due to intensive farming. Topsoil takes a thousand years to generate three centimeters, and all the world's topsoil could be gone by 2074. Earthworms play an important part in generating topsoil as their feces enrich the soil and shallow dwelling earthworms open pathways for air and water. Unfortunately, earthworms are slowly disappearing from the soil under our farmland after excessive overuse. 42% of fields in England now have a scarcity of absent or absence of surface dwelling and deep burrowing worms. All of the information including in this presentation leads us to a frightening place in human history. A fast increasing population expected to hit 10 billion by 2050. Less land, less food, less water, more disease, more extreme weather, floods, droughts and storms. Several reports emerged in 2019 claiming that civil societies could collapse within decades to, due to food shortages and conflict. These reports are not coming from left-leaning environmentalists. They are increasingly coming from fossil fuel executives like Ian Dunlop and the Pentagon. In 2017, 17 retired military officers sent a letter to US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson claiming, climate change poses strategically significant risks to US national security directly impacting our critical infrastructure and increasing the likelihood of humanitarian disasters, state failure and conflict. A further Pentagon report in 2019 claimed that the US military could collapse within 20 years due to climate change. The report, titled Implications of Climate Change for the US Army, stated that global starvation, war, disease, drought and a fragile power grid could have cascading devastating effects. 
What Al Gore called the inconvenient truth that has been laid out before us here is frightening. We are right to be frightened. After coming to terms with our alarming predicament, fear and anxiety are natural responses. This fear has been termed eco-anxiety. But I'm not here today to send you into a wild depression. There is no point in being depressed. I'm here today to give you an opportunity to stop these things from happening. If you look at the titles of these reports, you will see the use of could and if. These reports are not saying that there is going to be societal breakdown. They are warning us that unless we change course, this will be our future. Our elected officials have been complacent at best and complicit in the possible deaths of hundreds of millions and then billions at worst. The number of people who will die from the climate crisis and ecological breakdown will dwarf the number of people Stalin, Hitler or Mao killed. We are looking at the possible extinction of the majority of species on the planet, including our own. Are we going to stand silent as our governments and corporations continue to push us over this ecological cliff face? Or are we going to rise up peacefully and demand that they change course? But what can we do as individuals, right? Well, firstly, there are things we have the power to control, like our consumption. What we do, what we eat, what we talk about, how we travel. Taken together, these things add up to a lot. But they will not be enough to save us from the future scientists are warning us about. Secondly, we are not individuals, we are a society. By, our, by ourselves we are weak, but together we are strong. We cannot fight against the might of the state, even united as one. That is never going to work. What we need to do, and what research suggests is most effective, is to protest non-violently. Erika Chenoweth, a political scientist at Harvard University, analyzed both violent and non-violent protests around the world from 1900 to 2006. What she found was that non-violent protests were twice as likely to succeed as violent protests. 53% versus 26%. Non-violent protests were about were more inclusive. Women and children and less able people were able to join and these protests brought about the end of British rule in India and the end of the Marcos regime in the Philippines, to name just a few. An extra finding was that no non-violent protests failed in their demands if the threshold of 3.5% of the population participated actively. In Japan, 3.5% of the population amounts to 4.2 million people. The research shows that if we can mobilize 4.2 million Japanese people to demand change, then change will come. What is it Extinction Rebellion is demanding? We are demanding three things. Tell the truth. Government must tell the truth by declaring a climate and ecological emergency, working with other institutions to communicate the urgency for change. Act now. Governments must act now to halt biodiversity loss and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. Beyond politics, government must create and be led by the decisions of a citizens' assembly on climate and ecological justice. Those are our demands. We are not telling people what we should do. That is not what XR are about. We are not blaming people for their actions. We want all citizens to have a say in our future rather than continue to be blindly led by the same people that have allowed this to happen on their watch. The choice is stark right now. We can continue business as usual and see temperature rises of several degrees at least, extreme storms, droughts, floods, mass extinctions, water and food shortages, shortages and the resulting conflict. Or we can join together as one under the banner of Extinction Rebellion and peacefully demand that our governments tell the truth, act now, and implement a citizens' assembly. The UK government just agreed to set up a citizens' assembly after pressure from Extinction Rebellion in October. This follows the government declaring a climate emergency after the Spring Rebellion. Clearly, civil disobedience works. We need to ask ourselves what kind of future we want for ourselves and our children and grandchildren. Do we want 
extinction or rebellion.